In this video we're going to take a look at step 5 of the Cheat Engine built-in tutorial which looks at the code finder. If you didn't see the first episode in the series, we looked at the first four parts of the tutorial system which covered scanning for exact values, scanning for an unknown initial value and also scanning for floating point and double values. We then used what we learned from those four parts of the tutorial to increase our ammo on a game, a real game called Assault Cube. I'm going to slow things down a little bit for this video and for the future videos and try to just cover one tutorial segment per video and hopefully introduce some more advanced topics as we go. So as you can see I have part 5 of the tutorial open. You can see there's a password at the top so if you want to save that it's easy to resume from where you left off. Otherwise you can just click skip a few times and get back to stage 5 of the tutorial. And the description tells us that sometimes the location of a value is stored at changes when you restart the game or even when you're playing. In that case you can use two things to make a table that works and in this one we're going to look at the code finder. So it tells us that the value will be at a different location each time we start the tutorial so the normal entry in address list wouldn't work. First try to find the address. Okay so let's just demonstrate that first of all. As we did previously we'll make sure that we're connected to the tutorial so open that up in this little select process button and we want to start off with the first scan. We know what the initial value is, it's 100, so we can just type in here 100, we'll just leave the value type as default, but remember this might need to be changed. We'll do first scan, and now we've got a list of all the memory addresses which have a value of 100. You'll see some of them are in green with it, and actually you can see a DLL here, and also the tutorial EXE. These are base addresses which we'll talk about in future videos a little bit more. For now let's go change value and we can now say it's gone to 920 so we can either say that it's an increased value without saying what the value increased to or from or we can say it increased by 820 or we can just say that the new exact value is 920 so I'll do that one. Click next and we've only got one result. We can click change value again and we'll see now that the value is 981 it was previously 920 and it was originally 100, so we know that's definitely it. But, as the tutorial mentioned, if we now close down this tutorial and go and open it up again, move it back here and resize it a little bit, something like that. Okay, and then we go next, we'll go skip, skip, oh, skip and skip, we're back at stage 5. We need to attach it because it's a new process, so we'll go attach. Now it says, do you wish to keep this address list? So I'm going to say yes, but notice that this is now at question marks. It's not set as 100, and that's essentially because this value is different. So now if we go, let's do 100 again, we'll do a new scan, we'll do change value, it's now 978, so we'll enter that instead. And now we can see that this is added. So these are two different addresses, and essentially this is the address in RAM, in your memory, which is not going to be the same each time this program loads, and we want to try and find techniques which are more reliable for identifying where these interesting values are, so that you can essentially make persistent cheats or hacks. Okay, so that's fine. Let me delete the old one. That's not important anymore. Let's see what it's asking us to do. It says that we should right-click the address and choose find out what writes to this address. So we right click it and we can see that we've got F5 and F6 will show us what accesses the address and what writes the address. We've also got some other cool stuff here like generating a pointer map and pointer scan and browse the memory region. So we'll look at these things in future videos but for now let's do find out what writes this address. It asks us do we want to attach a debugger and we'll say yes. And then this window pops up and it's not going to have anything in it until we actually click change value again because now it's right into that address and you can see the count is 1. Every time we click that, that count is going to go up and this is the instruction and we can actually see down towards the bottom, here's a few, is like an, a snippet of the instructions so we're currently at this one so we can see the two instructions that came before it and the two that came after it and then we can also see the values of the registers. If you don't have any experience with reverse engineering or with assembly, this might sound a little bit confusing, so let me just try and go over some of the basics. In relation to computer memory, we have a CPU, we have our RAM, and we have our hard disk. And the first two, the CPU and the RAM, are volatile memory, which means every time you turn off your computer, every time it loses power, 
it's going to be wiped. It's not going to persist. Whereas the hard disk, the data is actually written to the disk or written to the magnetic strip or whatever. And whenever you boot the computer, it'll be able to load from that memory. It'll be able to read that memory. So if you think about it in terms of a game, whenever you install a game, there needs to be game files, which you can't store them in RAM because whenever you turn off your computer, you'll lose it all. And the same goes for game saves and things like that. Things that you want to be able to persist, you want to load them each time you run the game, they need to be in some kind of persistent memory. Whereas the RAM, which is what we're looking at here, you can see this address, which is holding our 719 value. And essentially each time we boot up the game, that's being populated with values. You also have static and dynamic memory. So the RAM, you can think like the stack and the heap, but I'm not going into too much detail on that now. Essentially, that's just the important thing to know is you have the CPU, which is the fastest memory source because it has these registers and these are very small. They don't hold much data, but they're very fast to work with. And the same with the cache and the CPU. And the general rule is that the, the greater the capacity, the slower it is. So if you think about the CPU, we measure these registers, the capacity of them and the cache in bytes and kilobytes. We measure RAM in megabytes and gigabytes, and we generally measure hard disks in terabytes. So they get bigger, but they also get slower. And if you want really high performing code, you want to essentially make the best use of the CPU registers and cache as possible and use RAM whenever you need a little bit more capacity and are able to sacrifice some speed. Let me also open up this more information, which just shows us pretty much what we see down here, but it gives us in a slightly bigger and better format, we can actually see the instruction that we're looking at in the moment. So this is the instruction move and this is the operation and here's our operands and we're saying we want to move whatever's in the EDX, we always start off at this furthest operand and that gets moved into, not into the RAX register, these are our registers here, our CPU registers, where we have RAX, RBX, RCX, etc. It's not being moved from the EDX register into the RAX register, it's being moved from the EDX register into the location pointed to by the RAX. So to clarify that a little bit, the EDX, let's say, here's our EDX here. It actually says RDX because it's a 64-bit processor. But whenever you're using a 64-bit processor, you can actually still refer to the lowest 32 bits of the register, which would be the EDX, and even the lowest 16 bits, which would be the DX. And that's all perfectly fine. Obviously, if you're using a 32-bit processor, you wouldn't have any of these R's at all. It'd just be EAX, EBX, ECX, etc. And what I meant by the literal value thing is at the moment, the literal value here in RDX is 2E7, which is in hex. We can convert that to decimal using like ascii to hex.com or Cyberchef or just a Windows calculator. But it's not moving the 2E7 to the RAX register it's moving the 2E7 to this address, which is being held in the RAX register. So that's a pointer. Essentially, this register is just pointing to another address in memory in the RAM. And that's where the 2E7 will be moved. And actually, if we go over and let me move this stuff out of the way a bit. If we go over here, that's the address that we have in here. This F1040 is the address that's in the RAX. So whenever we're saying move the value from the EDX to the value pointed to by the RAX, we're actually moving from, we're moving to E7 from the EDX to F1040. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me also open that up in, let's close that down. Let me show it in the dissembler. Okay. So this is the assembly code. You'll see stuff like this in Geardra if you ever use that for reverse engineering. And just to, again, go over the basics here in terms of what assembly code is. Whenever you write a program, generally you'll use a high level language like C, C++, Java, Python, etc. Things that are human readable, easy for us to program in, but that's not what the computer reads. Computer understands zeros and ones, machine code, and the programs are compiled into that machine code. So assembly is kind of a middle ground between the zeros and ones that computers understand, and then the high level languages that most programmers understand. And it gives us a raw operation. So we have the opcode here. This is the operation. So it's a mover operation. These are our operands EDX and RAX, and it's moving 
the value in the EDX to the value pointed to by the RAX. Also, we have some other instructions here. So you don't need to be an expert in assembly to go to understand this stuff. We don't need to know everything about it. Essentially, we can see plenty of move operations, which doesn't actually move the value, by the way, it just copies it, but we just call that move anyway, and it'll move these. And then down here, we have a compare instruction. So this is going to compare what's in the RBP register. What? Sorry. It's going to compare what's in the address pointed to by the RBP minus the offset of 14. And the RBP is our base pointer on the stack. And it's going to compare that with the value that's in the EAX. And then based on the result of that, that's going to return a result. And if they match, it's going to say jump if equal, because they were equal, so it'll jump here. If they don't match, it'll go here. So it's going to say compare these two values. If they match, jump to this location. If not, jump to this location. And we should be able to double click that. Oh, I think we can right click it and follow or space. And that will, we'll be able to go through and see where that's actually pointed to. We didn't have to go very far, as you can see. And that's basically our condition. So as you would see in a high level language, you'll see if statements. This is basically an if statement in assembly. So this will vary a little bit depending on the processor and the architecture. You'll have some different syntaxes for assembly language, but generally once you get to know the basics of what the registers are and these opcodes, so our move and our jump and jump if equal, jump not equal, etc., you'll be able to just at least follow along with the code in a in a basic way. Anyway, right, let's do what we need to do. We've been told that we want to knock out that instruction. Which instruction was it? It was the this one, this move EDX to RAX because, well, let me just show actually, let's right click it. Let's say replace with code that does nothing. And you could give it a name. I'm just gonna say, okay. And you can see that's NOP now. So it's no operation. It's not gonna actually do anything. It'll just skip down past these instructions to the next instruction. And what that means is that whenever we, let me, let's close this stuff down. Whenever we go and change the value now, it's not changing the value because that instruction was the instruction that was actually moving the value to this address. And because we've removed that instruction, there's nothing now moving that value. So we could actually right click and we could say, what writes the address? Click change value, nothing's happening. And the reason nothing's happening is because we've obviously already knocked out that instruction. Doing this will break the game, obviously. In this case, that was our intention. So we can now click next, but if this was a game and it, we hadn't done what we wanted it to do, we could also right click this. I'm sure there's different ways to do this, but I'm going to go browse memory region. It takes us back to these no operation instructions. And then we should be able to say restore with original code. And that should go back. Now, if we go change, we can see it's actually changing and you can actually see where this value is as well. Right? So we've got this six, eight, four, which it looked like was that AC zero two. Let's go calc. Let's go to programmer, set that to hex. And then if, in fact, let's set that to decimal. We'll do 684 and that's converted to 2AC, which you can see here is showing here AC and then two. The reason just being is it depends on the endianness. So sometimes you'll see that values need to be rewritten or uh, displayed in the opposite order. So it's the, it's not, here we have 2AC, it's not CA2, as you can see here, it stays in the correct endianness per byte. So it reverses the order of the bytes rather than reversing the order of the numbers in the hex string. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll go through a lot more of this stuff in detail as we go through the tutorials, and then we'll go and try to apply them to some real games as well. Okay, I think that's everything for this tutorial anyway. We'll click next. We know that the next episode is going to be focused on pointers. So I tried to cover pointers briefly today, but I don't want to scare people off on the second video. I know the first video was quite basic, probably compared to some of the concepts covered in this video. But let me know how you're finding it anyway. Are you enjoying this series? Are you interested to go and start game hacking on bug bounty programs? Are you looking to do just more game hacking for fun? Um, hopefully that is the case. And any general questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.